Thank you for that introduction, Michelle. So before we start, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context about Fiserv and the part of Fiserv we work in, digital channels. So as Xiao said, Fiserv is a fin financial technology company. We develop the, uh, the back-end systems for a lot of the banking, the large banks and credit unions around the world, especially in the States. And the part of uh, Fiserv that we work in, digital channels, we work on putting that functionality into the hands of consumers. Just to give you a si uh, an idea of the size or scale of Fiserv, we have about 23,000 associates worldwide. But in digital channels, the part that we work in, we have, we're across six locations, as you can see on there. So as well as being here in Auckland, New Zealand, we're on the east and west coast of the States, and um, in Costa Rica, in Pune in India, and now in our most recent acquisition in London as well. And across all of those sites, we have probably seven main products. And they range from uh, smartphone apps uh, for banking and tablet apps, but also online banking, voice-activated banking, and a bunch of other services like smart messaging and notifying and so on. And it's a, it's a complex integration of lots and lots of different capability. Just to give you an idea, within digital channels alone, we have 50 delivery teams, 14 of which are here in New Zealand. And we're, we are responsible for helping coach and lead people in those teams across all of those sites. We were already working at the team delivery team level with Agile and, and Scrum uh, for some years, when then we realized that the market was overtaking us, even an organization the size of us. We were pretty waterfall in the way we were bringing work to the teams and the way that we were taking work from the teams and out to market. <laughs> what some of you might recognize as water scrum fall. So we realized that we needed to change that. And so our talk today is going to be about the journey that we've gone on and some of the key learnings that we've made that we'd like to share with you. So as we go through, and what's been really interesting to listen, listening about to some of the talks over the last few days is the first topic we're going to talk about is how we put people at the center of that transformation. Then we're going to talk about the approach to change that we took and why that was in, uh, instrumental to the success of it and how we adapted that over time. And then we're going to talk about how we sustain the momentum beyond that big transformation and, and where we're headed with that now. And then we're going to end up with everyone's favorite topics, governance and metrics, right? Um, but what we mean by that is how we keep governance lean and how we ensure transparency. Thanks, David. Uh, so uh, in this theme, we're going to be talking about um, people and how important they are in the success of the transformation. So I'd just like to take you on my own personal journey of my time at Fiserv. Uh, during this transformation, I have become an emergent leader, and I'd like to share with you how that story has come about. So our transformation kicked off about 18 months ago. At that time, I'd just been promoted to a director role. What that meant is I now managed business analysts, not just in Auckland, which was what my previous role was, but I now had BAs across all those locations that David mentioned. It meant that my range of stakeholders got hugely larger and I had to start understanding a whole lot of product lines that I'd had very little exposure to. At the same time as that promotion, there was this thing being led out of the US called the value delivery transformation. We didn't really know a lot about what it meant. We knew that we had to get out of this water scrum fall uh, and we also had a change in executive leadership. So we had a new uh, senior vice president come in who knew that for us to be relevant in the market, we needed to change how we got work into teams and how we got it back out to the market. And we also had a week-long training, which was more like a crash course on how we now needed to operate. At the same time as the kickoff of this, of this value delivery transformation, we had a governance group established. This governance group was called the Transformation Leadership Team, or the TLT. In my new director role, I was asked to start attending the Transformation Leadership Team. It was an interesting experience attending that. Uh, it was six hours worth of meetings a week, which was spread out across two days, and there was heaps of people on this call. So obviously a lot of our meetings are kind of calls because of all the different stakeholders in different locations. Um, we had a range of different people on the TLT, and it was really because everybody wanted to be involved 
but more importantly, everybody just wanted to understand the impact. What does this mean to me and what does this mean to my team? So I started attending this meeting and remembering I didn't really know a lot of people who were on the transformation leadership team. And I started to have more questions than answers. I was thinking, so why are we doing it like this? And how are we meant to be achieving that goal? And weren't we meant to have delivered that last week? And nobody seems to be holding each other to account. I guess I was ask, thinking about all the awkward questions and the BA and me were starting to come out. So within a few weeks, I decided to be a little bit brave. And I, there was a little gap, and I thought, I'll just step into that gap, and I'll ask one of those awkward questions. Then when nothing exploded, I thought, oh, I might just ask another awkward question and see what happens. Now, it was a pretty hard and scary place to do that, and it still is sometimes. But the key for me was finding partners, people that I could trust and people I could rely on. People that I could say, that would say to me, Julie, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, or it's just a little bit crazy, I don't think that's gonna work. And the outcome of all of this is I was promoted to be the chair, well, I was asked, nominated to be the chair of the transformation leadership team within a couple of months. And um, I'm also now known as someone who delivers, someone who holds account, someone who's an emergent leader within the organization. And I'd like to think I do it in a pretty positive, enthusiastic manner as well. Uh, the TLT still exists, or the Transformation Leadership Team still exists 18 months later, but we only meet once every fortnight for an hour, and there's only a handful of us left, including David and I. And we're the people who are still the key change agents within the organisation, and we're seeing, trying to bring in continual improvement to the Digital Channels Division. And Julie is a great example of somebody that emerged as a leader. And where people have that courage, one of the scrum values, uh, to step forwards and step into that gap and be brave, that's really, really cool. But it's not always, that doesn't always naturally happen. Sometimes we need to find those people that have some good experience or are pretty engaged and, and are, are willing uh, to act as champions, to advocate for what you're doing when we're operating a transformation at the scale that we are working on, we couldn't be present in all the sites where the discussions were happening and the problems were being discussed. So we needed people that would be able to advocate for what we were doing. Now, not everyone is even in the right space to be a champion or an advocate naturally. So we decided we had to look for people that had some good experience, they learned agile through doing it, um, and just needed a bit of nurturing to get that kind of engagement up so that they could be the advocates or people that were pretty engaged but not that experienced and to work with them so that they understood it more and so we focused on that but critically we didn't want this transformation to be top down it's important to have uh, advocacy and support from the very top as we did but it wasn't just a top down transformation so we were pretty relaxed about who we had on these teams as we were form forming them not just the transformation leadership team but as julie said we had quite a number of different people on that, but a bunch of other teams as well. If people felt they had a voice that should be heard or there was something that they wanted to bring to the table, we let them come onto those teams. That was 18 months ago. So about six months ago, we sat down with a lot of them and we started reviewing their purpose and helped them identify and become crystal clear on what it is that they're planning to do, what they need to do. And then for lots of them, they identified who should be, who, who is core to that purpose and either people voluntarily stepped back so that they just became consulted, or we identified gaps and, and we identified people that we needed to bring in. So that was really important. It took some time to get there, but it made sure that everybody came on that journey. But also importantly, because a lot of those new teams, as you'll see later, are about sort of orchestrating and management and thinking at that sort of level. We wanted everyone in the organization to feel that they had a voice, that they could influence what was being done. So we set up a mechanism for anybody to be able to submit a request or a recommendation or question to the transformation leadership team. And getting ready for this talk, I did a quick census and saw that we'd had over 60 requests over the last 12 months since we've been doing that. That's over five a month. Out of that, quite remarkably, more than three quarters have been approved and either already implemented or currently in progress. Fewer than a quarter, so only 14 out of all of those were rejected or declined, and always, always with a good reason. 
So that's important because it made sure that everybody was engaged and everybody felt that they could influence the outcome. It kept it adaptive. I went to the Weta workshops or the Weta Cave tour on Saturday. So I'd already decided I was going to use this quote already, but it became kind of really apposite. This is a quote from Tolkien. Even the smallest person can influence the whole, the course of the universe. And I think that's, that's a, a kind of a really good idea to keep hold of as we put, put people central to the transformation. Alongside that, though, we need to think about the approach to change. And look, we're at Agile New Zealand, so we know that when we're changing our product or developing our service and software, we don't do it in big batches. We know that big batches is inherently risky. If it goes well, then that's fine. But if it goes wrong, the impact is big. Well, of course, changing our organizations is even bigger. And therefore, the risk is even higher. And we heard yesterday several people uh, talk about um, you don't become, you shouldn't adopt Agile using a waterfall process. That's absolutely right. So we've adopted uh, the lean, a lean change approach. So taking those big changes and chunking them down into minimum viable changes, MVCs, like an MVP. Something that we could implement within three months, but would have a lasting impact. And then we broke those down into smaller safe to fail steps that probably take around two to four weeks to do. That allowed us to create 90 day coaching plans that we could then work on with the teams as they were coming on board and take them through that process. So that was really important. But something that we, then this was taking an adaptive approach to the transformation. So we inspected and adapted as we went. And a really good example of that is actually more recently within the last four or six months, we've realized that having a 90 day coaching plan makes it very coach led. And that's still a little bit top down. With the number of teams that we had on board, we needed them, we wanted them to feel that they had buy-in to that process as well. So we've shifted the onus to the teams. Each of those teams has their own improvement backlog, much like a delivery team will, and they'll add things to that during their retrospectives. And they'll call on us if they need some guidance or they need some specific training, but we're looking to them more and more to help resolve those problems for themselves, just as we do with delivery teams. So that's an important factor as well. Overlay onto this though, as, as it probably implied when we had that, the, the 90 day coaching plans, we were running the change at the same speed for everybody. So we recognized that actually not everybody starts from the same place. We had different geographical locations, so we've got different national cultures at play, but also you've got different functions in different locations and, and they have their own way of thinking and being as well. So there's a couple of good models. There's the Schneider culture model, which is quite cool, uh, but also uh, Bob Marshall's right shifting uh, model is also really, really useful. And when we thought about where our organization largely was, we would say that it's in that analytic space and has a culture of control, if you're familiar with the Schneider model. What that means is, because we operate in the financial services industry, it's quite heavily regulated, especially in the US. So we optimized ourselves in pretty much quite a siloed sort of way uh, to work in that space. And then, of course, we had to follow process. We had to make sure that we complied with that. So there was a lot of control in, in place. But as we said earlier, we needed to make sure that we could become more adaptive. So as well as developing quality product, we needed to be able to get more features out to market more quickly than some of our competitors were starting to do. So we needed to shift out of that analytic into that synergistic space where we could be a little bit more adaptive, a little bit more exploratory, and start being more collaborative and so forth. And we know that agile principles and practices are key to shifting. But that shift from the analytic to the synergistic mindset is the hardest one, if you're familiar with Bob Marshall's framework. Uh, and agile is really critical to that shift. Thanks, David. So the third thing that we're going to talk through is about change versus stability and about autonomy and trust uh, at scale. And like we mentioned, it's pretty large scale as well. So I was going to point to this, but I'll get out of the camera. So <laughs> where were we when we started? We were kind of in that inertia stage. So our need for stability was really high. We, were a financial we are a financial services company and um, we were very risk adverse. And the desire for change was quite low. There were a few of us who knew we needed to change, 
but there were such large organisational impediments that were stopping us from moving up that change into that higher area of change. Uh, and the transformation really turned that over and allowed us to try and address some of those organisational impediments. So we mentioned that it was, um, we needed to make incremental change, but we knew that the overall outcome was going to be big change. It was going to be really huge change in terms of how we all operated and how we worked. But remembering this was less about how we worked at a development team level and much more around how managers and leaders were going to have to change. And yes, we changed process, but the other thing that we've, has been really important is we changed our culture and our mindset as to how we were going to do this. There are a couple of key things that we looked at. One was transparency. We needed to stop hiding behind issues. Uh, we work for a large company and we have many dependencies between other groups within our organisation. It's very easy to hide behind, oh, that group didn't deliver when they said they would, or they've got these constraints and so we can't do anything about it. We really had to challenge that mindset. Uh, we also needed to work together. We needed to stop trying to throw things over the wall and hope that someone else would catch it and solve that problem, like support would pick it up for us. Uh, this transformation was much more about how we all worked together to collaborate, to actually get software out there that worked and could be supported. And we knew we needed to get releases out to the market more often. We were only releasing about once a year for each product line, and that just wasn't enough and it wasn't, gonna, it wasn't supporting what our customers required. Now, don't expect that you'll get it right the first time, because we didn't. And actually, you won't, because you can't lay a perfect plan out and expect it's just going to follow along that plan. What you need to do is break it down into increments, like David was saying. You need to learn and adapt and move forward. During, the, during a period of high transformation, I was hearing a lot of comments like, can we stop making changes? Can we just be stable? My team is really change fatigued. It was something that I really struggled with because, well, not I struggled with, but I struggled hearing about because while I understand that big change is exhausting, and I know I was exhausted as well at the same time, you can't just sit idle, you can't just wait. The market moves around you, people move around you. You have to adapt and grow all the time. You need to be continually trying to push yourself forward. It's really not about that destination, it's much more about m making those small incremental ch changes so we can see continual improvement. And so where are we now? Well, uh, we're still in the st high stability, but not as high as before. We're not nearly as rigid as we were before. Um, and I would actually say part of that is having uh, risk and audit involved in our collaboration exercises. They understand a lot more what we're trying to achieve. And our desire for change is much higher. As leaders, we know there has to be a better way than what we were doing. So I'm not saying we're in the sustainable transformation bubble, because we've still got a way to go but we're definitely at that kind of pointy head of the continual improvement arrow. Just give you a minute to read this quote, because I think it really sums up nicely what we've been trying to achieve. So the thing I like about this quote is it says, we need enough stability so we can be certain, but we need enough change so that we can adapt. So I just want to leave you with a bit of a word of warning, though, about people and changing their mindsets. I said that leaders needed to change their mindsets, and at times you think, oh, yeah, they've got it. Like, they understand where we're going, and they understand the journey we're on. And then under real high pressure or high stress, they revert back to the way they were because that's what's comfortable for them. If I can give you a personal anecdote, uh, before I joined Fireserve, I was in a demand and control company, and I was a manager, and I told people what to do, and they followed my instructions. Uh, that's far from my management style now, where I'm much more around how do we, this is the outcome, how are we going to achieve it? But I still catch myself every now and then in high periods of pressure saying, can you just do it like this? And it's been three years since that was my default style. Okay, so the second aspect is, autonomy and trust, and how do you build this at scale? So when we started this transformation off, decisions were being made in locations across the world, 
by senior leaders. We didn't know when the meetings were going to be, who was going to be there, what the decision was, what the conversation was, and where we were meant to move forward from. Now, we did have different disciplines being represented at those meetings, but often they were too high up the chain that they didn't understand the implications of the decisions that they were making. The transformation really turned this on its head. Now, it looks very hierarchical, but David and I will explain why it works. So let me set some context. We have a portfolio management team. Uh, this team manage, uh, so I'll use an example. So we have in New Zealand, we develop and support mobile banking, which we call mobility. So we have a mobility portfolio management team, and under that we have three product lines. So we have three core product teams, and they manage each product line. At the portfolio management team, we have directors and lead product managers. We make decisions around priorities of epics that we want to get to the market, what the quality might look like, what resourcing profile we might need to um, achieve those outcomes of the epics. This core product team is, um, and in the core product teams, we see kind of managers and product owners. They really take the work out of the PMT to the CPT, break it down into features, and they get into more detail around like assumptions and dependencies. But they own the release, like they have responsibility for that. Um, <coughs> Where the portfolio management team is important for them is where they've got organisational impediments that they can't resolve, so they will come to the PMT to talk that through, or if they need assistance with reprioritisation because of changes to the market or changes in need. So how does this work? How do we build autonomy and trust out of a, something that looks so hierarchical? Well, firstly, like I said, each team needs to be autonomous. They need to understand what they're responsible for and what they own. This means for some of the PMT members, or portfolio management team members, they need to back out of the detail. And that's hard for some of them, right? They need to trust that the core product team have got it. Yes, they need transparency of information, they can't kind of be blind, but they need to trust that this core product team can deliver. And in return, the CPT needs to own that they are responsible for the delivery of that, of that release. They can't leave gaps and hope the PMT is going to sweep it up and solve it for them. They have full responsibility for that release. And also, we have to have really clear expectations. I sit at the portfolio management team, and I have to have an expectation of what is my role at the PMT, what is the role of the PMT, and does the CPT understand that? And does the core product team understand what their role is and what the portfolio management team needs from them as well? And so how we actually achieve this autonomy and trust actually depends a lot on culture. So I sit at several portfolio management team levels, um, product lines, and how we've achieved this is different based on the product line. So for one of our New Zealand, for the New Zealand product line of mobility, uh, they, we asked this core product team to come up to the portfolio management team meeting once a, once a month and talk about the health of their product line so that we get a feeling as a portfolio management team how, re how the release is going. Uh, at a US, for one of the US-based portfolio management team meetings, they actually have a separate meeting where the portfolio management team says, this is what we're doing for you as a core product, manage, core product team, and the core product team says, this is what we're doing for you, PMT. So it really does depend on how they think they're going to best work. And of course, one of the key things that we've stri strived to do right from the very beginning is to ensure that these new teams that we introduced to replace the management that was happening in, off in silos in different places followed a lot of the same agile principles that we already had in our delivery teams. So we know in our delivery teams, we have some, uh, some, some roles such as the product owner and the scrum master, as well as team members. So in these core product teams and portfolio management teams, we also saw that there was a need to have roles like this. So we have a role of chair, and the chair pretty much acts as the product owner. So they're there to make, make the call if there's a key decision that needs to be made, um, and, and the group is undecided. Um, and as a product owner would, is responsible for a lot of that prioritization. And then each of these teams also has a facilitator, again, acting much like a scrum master would on a delivery team, helping the team to organize and to resolve impediments and so forth. And then the rest of the team 
is made up of a number of different capabilities. So I've just modeled here, we've got development in QA, UX and BA, but also importantly, support and client ops. And the makeup of these teams will differ by product. But the important thing is, it's all the capabilities that are required to get new things for the product defined and to also get it out to market as well. So just the same as we do with delivery teams. As well as being cross-functional, they're self-organizing or autonomous, as, as Julia has discussed. Um, and I mentioned earlier that each of them have a purpose. They also have a working agreement, and they hold themselves accountable to that. And much as our delivery teams work to a two-weekly sprint cadence, uh, these teams work to a monthly cadence. So at the beginning of the month or at regular intervals, they'll be thinking, what is it that we need to be doing this month to get work ready for the teams? So what's going into the backlog? Um, and as Julie said, they hold a regular review with the main stakeholders, which is primarily the portfolio management team. And then also importantly, they have a retrospective to say, how effective are we being as a team? That's critical. But also because at these different levels, they're working on defining uh, the, the capabilities for the product as epics and features before we get to the stories for the teams. They have a definition of ready and a definition of done for those as well. So between some of these key meetings that we talked about there, they're swarming on that work to get things ready uh, for the teams and also to get it out again at the end. So that's an important, um, important that we're keeping those teams uh, true to the agile principles as well, even though that they're made up of managers and directors. And then lastly, we wanted to talk to you about governance and metrics. Now, we talked before about water scrum fall, and we wanted to do away with that waterfall front end and the waterfall back end so that we never starved or blocked the teams. We had a bad experience two and a half or so years ago where teams had got one release out and they were ready to start the next one, and there was no backlog ready for them. So I'm sure at times we may have experienced that. Maybe it's been a rocky start to a sprint, but actually this took nearly two sprints to get the backlog actually ready. And that was a really, really bad example of how getting stuck in doing the, what we would probably call big design up front stops us getting work ready for the teams in time. So we had to do away with that. So that's the approach that we took. Um, and we did away with the project delivery framework and ended up with a product delivery life cycle. Um, uh, the important thing is, though, as I mentioned before, that we made it uh, a, a possible for anyone in the organization to suggest changes or make, or make recommendations and ask questions. That means that um, the uh, PDLC, as it is now, Product Delivery Lifecycle, is not the same as it was 18 months ago. There's been over 40, maybe 45 changes to it over that time. When you're making changes to a process, it's really important to focus on keeping it lean. Um, we had Mike talk about the rocks and the logs in, uh, that, that kind of block the flow. And we had the two A's yesterday, Aldo and Andy, talk about entropy. If you take your eye off something, it will just get worse and unravel. So we had to focus on keeping it lean. And that combination of focusing on keeping it lean and having everybody buy into it being an adaptive process meant that um, the adoption of it improved. Nine months into that transformation, so nine months ago, we started tracking how well we were following the process. So when we did that, we found uh, it was quite shocking to begin with, but transparency is meant to show us the horrible things as well as the good things, right? Our compliance with the process was less than 1%, which was pretty shocking from an organization that's heavily regulated and, and compliance is important. <laughs> a couple of months back, we reached a high point of around 85%. So by, by that, we mean we're doing things on time, we're, we're getting everything ready and, and so on. It's dropped off a bit now, so it's about 72, 73% compliance. And that just sounds like numbers to you, I know. We've brought on new products, we've acquired new products, and we're bringing on new teams. And obviously, for them, the process and the way we're working is different. Some of them have not worked in an agile way before, even at the delivery team level. So of course, it's gonna be rocky as we bring them on board, and we'll see that go up again. We shouldn't expect it to be stable. It will go, sort of go up and down as situation and circumstances change. Okay, so metrics. Uh, I mentioned before about transparency and about how the PMT needs to understand the performance of our product line, and metrics this is one way that we achieve this. Now, on a personal note, I'm not such a big fan of metrics. I'm much more a people person than I am a numbers person. Uh, but a senior leader at work recently said to me, 
Julie, as a leader, don't you think you should care about the metrics? To which my response was, yep, I suppose you're right. So let's just say that some of us like them and some of them don't, but regardless, we have to work with them and we need to make sure that they're telling us what we need. So when we first published the metrics, uh, there were quite a few sad paint people, but actually quite a lot of angry people, people who are all saying, this is not how the health of my product line looks like. We're in a much better state than this. And actually it gave us the first point to start having a conversation around those metrics and start trying to dig deep into why are we seeing the metrics as they are. Uh, and one of the good things that we've been able to implement as part of our transformation is we have one system of record which the portfolio management team use, the core product team use, and the delivery teams. So actually it's quite easy to find where the problem spots are in that data. So what do we report on? Well, there's two things. There's this white paper, software development process improvement metrics, which tells us about performance, standards, and expectations. The second element is, what do I as a manager care about? Because actually, that's the metrics that mean a lot to me. And what you can see there on the left-hand side is our mobility product line. This is a scorecard at the portfolio management team level. Uh, and this tells us the, talks to us about the performance of that product line. The good thing about these scorecards is they roll up and they roll down. So we can roll them all the way up to digital channels, which is the division we work on to understand how we're going with our products. And we can roll it down into the core product teams, which is much more around those small um, products, I guess, or small increments of the delivery. So it's one thing to have metrics. It's another one to actually do something with it, right? So once a month, we report the metrics out at what is called an extended leadership team deck. Just a lot of jargon, really. But what it tells us is we get this scorecard, right? So for our mobile product line, we get this scorecard, and every product line has their own scorecard. We then have a meeting at that portfolio management team, and we bring members of the core product team, and we have a conversation around this. So I kind of think metrics are a conversation starter. It's an opportunity for us to start talking about where we think we are. And in those meetings, we tend to talk about, like, this last month, does that seem about right from what the metrics are telling us? And where are we trending? Where have we been in the last two months prior? And are we heading in the right direction? Uh, often that leads to a lot of conversation and quite a lot of follow-up. Uh, and then the third step to that is we actually have the extended leadership team meeting. Now, what's key to that is the directors actually own a portion of the deck, which is kind of a whole lot of these performance indicators. And so as a director, I'm expected to talk about that product line, and I'm expected to answer all kinds of questions from more senior leaders. And what that means is I now have accountability. I now need to understand what does the metrics actually mean, and can I answer those tricky questions? Now, don't get me wrong, we've still got a little way to go on this, um, but we're starting to see some improvement, I would say, in the last couple of months. Um, and key to that has been people understanding what it actually means. So, for example, there is one up there which is like the fourth line down, which is Epic Backlog. People are like, what is Epic Backlog and how are you getting that number? So we're starting to get a better understanding of actually what is it, how are we generating that number and how are we getting to that target of, I think for one of them it's like 600 and we're not nearly there. So why are we not nearly there? And that's the point, it's to try and start having those conversations. Okay, so we'd like to sum up. Uh, and one of the things we thought was really important is to be able to tell you what have we achieved. So we've been through this transformation, we've learned a lot, but what is the actual impact? And there's been pretty good impact, actually. So um, I mentioned that we were only releasing once a year. So we've got seven product lines. It's about seven releases in a year. Uh, we, in the last 18 months this year, we will release over 20 times. So that's three releases a year. Sorry, a threefold increase. It's about three releases per product line a year. And for our mobile product line in particular, which is a pretty hot burning uh, product line that everyone wants to get involved in, uh, in 12 months we've gone from only having seven markedly significant features, this is for the US market, to 17. We've gone from one of the lowest scoring um, products for Fiserv branding to now the top scoring for the mobile features that we offer to the market. 
And all of this has been at the same time as increasing our number of scrum teams and we're now introducing more technically complex pieces of work as well. And we're getting really good customer feedback, which is all important. <laughs> Before the transformation, we were hearing a lot of, um, we don't believe you when you say you're gonna release on that date and we don't believe what you're gonna have in that release. Well, we've turned that around. We don't hear stuff like that anymore. What we hear is, can you put more stuff in your app? <laughs> Um, and the other thing that I think is important is we've created a lot more collaboration. We've really dropped all those silos of I'm a BA, I'm a dev, I'm a QA, I'm support, <laughs> to all sitting around that table and collaborating together and working together through our releases. So with five minutes left, um, just want to recap on, on, on the key learnings that we've had over this time. Um, and, and what we'd like you to take away. So importantly, we found that we really had to put people at the center of the transformation. That's what we started with. That was a fundamental principle. We also took that lean change approach, breaking the big changes down into small ones, and then learnt later, we needed to pace that differently depending on the cultural settings of, of different parts of the organization. And um, we we found that we needed to focus on keeping that governance structure, that, that process we were following, as lean as possible, because it will grow. That's the, na that's the nature of governance. It will just grow and grow if you don't, if you don't pay attention to it. Um, and also ensuring transparency, top to bottom, all the way through. The tool that we're using for um, backlog management is the same tool we're using for transparency, version one. It means anyone in the organization can see what's happening anywhere with any team on any product. It's a frightening place to be sometimes, but it's, it's actually empowering because it gives you the information you need to have some of those critical conversations. As Julie said, metrics really should be a conversation starter. So we've come a long way and we've learned an awful lot. And if we started it out again now, would we do it the same way? Probably not, or maybe I can say, hell no. <laughs> um, but we had to go through that experience to learn what we know now, and that's really important. Um, and uh, one overriding thought above all of those is to make sure whatever you're doing, keep it adaptive. Inspect and adapt, rinse and repeat. That's important. Yeah. Um, and I'm really proud of what we've managed to achieve, especially out of little old New Zealand. David and I have achieved a lot in the last kind of 18 months. And I'm really grateful to work for a company like Fiserv where I have autonomy, we have trust, and we all challenge each other because we always know there's got to be a better way to achieve this. Thank you.